I hope this is, it is working. It's lovely. Well, thank you all for coming. We're so pleased that we've got an overflow house here. Uh, and that shows the attraction of the topic tonight, I'm sure. Uh, Ellen Montgomery always draws people in. And um, this is also uh, the night of our annual general meeting. I'm Doug Sobey the president of the Bedeck Area Historical Society. And this is the third in our series of talks uh, titled The Bedeck Museum's um, Prince Edward Island 150 Talks, which uh, are funded by the Prince Edward Island 150 Celebration Fund, which enables us to give our speakers a larger gratuity than, than normally we would be able to, plus also more publicity for the talks. Uh, all of the talks are in some way associated with the 150th anniversary of Confederation, either the actual events as we heard in the, the first talk by Ed, Ed MacDonald, uh, uh, who was looking at the political history, the clothing we looked at last week, the clothing that people were wearing in the 1860s and 70s, and this evening we're going to hear, I'll, I'll come to this evening's talk in a moment, but, uh, and uh, uh, introduce our speaker. But I first want to say that um, uh, we have uh, this evening uh, uh, raffle tickets for sale, it's our one of our main um, Fundraising events is um, our seafood raffle, and if you can support us before you go by buying a ticket, five dollars for one, or three for ten, and you you have the chance of winning two hundred and fifty dollars worth of lobster, a hundred dollars worth of oysters, or fifty dollars worth of seafood or lobster. And it doesn't matter whether you win or not, your money will go to a good cause. And of course, you know that is the purpose of, um, of, of our raffle and many others on the island. And we also have memberships in the Bedeck Area Historical Society. Uh, it's $20 per person, or $25 for a family or household. And that also helps to uh, support us. Uh, through memberships. It also gives you, uh, uh, you come on to our mailing list and then receive our newsletters, plus also notices of all events, and uh, are supporting and in, in, in contact with all activities of the museum. Um, I think those are all the household announcements. We have refreshments, uh, we'll have so uh, soft drinks, or well, juices. Uh, later on at the, the end, and uh, any donations uh, uh, that you can give are appreciated in the donation baskets. Um, well, tonight's uh, topic, uh, which you can see on the screen already, relates to uh, Lucy Maud Montgomery, and I want to introduce our speaker. I, I first met Jean Mitchell uh, in 2006, has my voice gone? No, it's still there. When um, uh, I spoke to her sociology and anthropology class at the University of Prince Edward Island on the subject of forest history and changing attitudes of islanders in the early colonial period to the forests. Now, Jean, Dr. Jean Mitchell, uh, was the inaugural L.A. Montgomery Scholar at the University of Prince Edward Island. And I assume, Jean, that means you are the first of, uh, in that role. And, and the University of Prince Edward Island has, for many years, um, uh, supported an Ellen Montgomery Institute. And every two years, there are conferences uh, on the topic of Montgomery and her writings. And Jean has been 
always involved in those over the 20 or more years, 30 years probably, on which they have been uh, taking place. And uh, as a result, she has edited uh, various publications on Ellen Montgomery, uh, Storm and Dissonance, Ellen Montgomery and, Con and Conflict in 2008, and she co-edited Anne Around the World, Ellen Montgomery and her classic in 2013. I'm not sure quite what that means, and her classic. It was the anniversary of 100 oh. years of Anne. Oh, yes. And the classic refers to Anne of Green Gables. Yes. Okay. And, uh, and then, um, more recently, uh, the award-winning Ellen Montgomery and the Matter of Nature, uh, which was published in 2018. Uh, she is currently the UNESCO Chair of Island Studies and Sustainability at the University of Prince Edward Island. So you have very diverse roles within the university. Now, the significance of Lucy Maud Montgomery, L.A. Montgomery, in this series of talks, uh, as, Jane, uh, as Jean pointed out in her, uh, her summary of her talk, is that L.A. Montgomery was born in 1874 and uh, thus uh, was, or grew up as both an islander and a Canadian, one of the first generation of islanders to uh, accept that they also were Canadians, which was a very foreign word at that time, referring to uh, really upper and lower Canada. So I am going to call Jean forward, and uh, we will welcome her to give her Before we get started, yes. maybe to whet people's appetite about the history here, I was reading in the County Line Courier the background for this talk, and it mentioned that uh, Maud was born um, a year after K uh, PEI joined Confederation. And I've done history interpretation at Green Gables for six or seven years. Never once thought about that particular aspect of it. I was also reading La Voix Cadienne earlier today, and they mentioned that when PEI joined the Confederation for the reasons that it did, most islanders did not want to be in Canada, including the Acadians. And given the fact that Maud was born a year after that, and the personality of her grandparents, and I don't know if you're going to be talking about this through, this, through the thing, but you might want to reference it anyways, I'm wondering how that island view of Canada might have uh, affected Maud Montgomery as she grew up. Would, uh, I, I'm just, I'm just going to stop, stop you there. We'll keep the questions for the end. Uh, we, want, we, you know, we want to hear the speaker first. So say, save your question for the end, and I'm sure it, uh, uh, Jean would be very willing to answer it then. But we, we really came here to hear Jean, so... But, but thank you very much for your thank you very much for your comments and your questions. It'll be interesting to talk to you. Uh, so I start this this is one of my favorite photographs of Montgomery's. She was a photographer, of course, as well as a writer. And it's just such a beautiful photo of people nestled under the sandstone. And of course it's her family. And you'll notice um, that there's shadows and light. And as a photographer, she played with shadows and light and in her photography, but also in her fiction. So in preparation for this talk, I did one thing that I was so happy about, which was read the selected journals number one again. 
and it was so filled with joy because I had been working on Montgomery's and the latter part of her life, which, which had become somber and sad. And it was so beautiful to return to the first, to her childhood, when she had, she was so full of joy, she was so precocious, she was so vivacious, and I am certain everyone fell in love with her. She was constantly getting marriage proposals, and she was so fed up <laughs> that she couldn't find some, a boy who didn't want to marry her. <laughs> so I, I just want to say that thank you, Doug, for this this occasion, and thank you everyone for giving up a a beautiful summer evening to come here. So um, I'll just start here, and um, I have notes, and I see how we do. So Ella Montgomery was born in 1874 just one year before Confederation. Her mother was Clara McNeil from Cavendish, the daughter of an English woman and of a farmer and postmaster, Alexander, um, uh, and, and, um, <clears throat> and, sorry, and, and postmaster, Alexander McNeil. Now, um, her, her father was Hugh Mc, Mc, Montgomery from Park Corner, he was the son of Senator Donald Montgomery. Both of her, both her great, her grandfather, that is Donald Montgomery, was a senator and had been involved in politics for, from, for a very, very long time. And also her great grandfather was quite a well-known politician as well, but he was a liberal. So in any case, <laughs> uh, so she came from this very political, uh, political context. But um, Donald Montgomery was immersed in politics, and and you know he took after Confederation took place, he became a senator. Now her people were substantial people, the McNeils and the Montgomerys. They were very substantial people, and Cavendish was an extremely well developed rural community, and so she was born into a flourishing community. She was born into a community of storytellers. And that um, has made a huge difference in her life. However, tragedy struck at a very early age. Her mother died at 23 years of age when, when Montgomery was only two years old. Um, you know, many of us of a certain age would know very well that we have relatives in our family that died prematurely due to tuberculosis and polio, for example, later on in the 1940s. So, so death of a parent was, was, was not an uncommon thing. But for Montgomery, it was a theme, it was an element of her life that she continuously returned to. The, the, the theme of mother loss was written in, encoded into so much of her work. Of course, orphans, semi-orphans populate her novels. So in any case, um, so, so this photo of Montgomery on the left is one that I, I find so beautiful too because Montgomery in, in many ways was set apart by pain, to use her words. She felt her life and the way that her life unfolded had, had made her different from other people. And, I, and that photograph is so beautiful. It's as if she's at the edge of the world or at the beginning of the world. And so I just, I will start with that tragedy. Now, when her mother died, it was decided, of course, that uh, she would go and live with grandparents and she, she, <coughs> lived with, she lived with the McNeils. Now, when the McNeils took over Montgomery's, this two-year-old, they had already had seven children. They were in their mid-50s and they were mourning their daughter. And that was the context for Montgomery's move to the house in Cavendish. Now, Anne, of course, was her most, Anne of Green Gables was her most flamboyant orphan. But I will return to the novels later. At the moment, I just want to talk about um, her father a bit. When her mother died, uh, her father, 
he had started a store in Clinton, which is near around New London. And somehow the store or it just wasn't enough to keep him on the island. So I would think that perhaps it was the pull of the new nation to go west. So he migrated to, to Port to um, Prince Albert out in Saskatchewan. And so um, he spent the rest of his life there. He, of course, came occasionally to visit Montgomery, but she loved her father very deeply. And again, mourn that distance that between Prince Edward Island and and uh, her father in Saskatchewan. So the young Montgomery visited her father in 19, 1890. She was 16 years old. Um, I just want to show you, Claire, this is the grandmother who raised, grandmother McNeil, Lucy McNeil, who raised Montgomery. And here is Montgomery at eight and at 17. So you can imagine Montgomery at 16 years of age going out to Saskatchewan to visit her father. It's unclear whether she was going to go out for a long time or just for a year or to try it out, but she went out there. And um, it was a very pivotal moment for her as a young person. It was definitive definitive of her, 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 her personhood, who she was, and also the sense of Canada that she acquired by taking a train across Canada. For the very, very few people would have traveled as she did at such a young age. On the day that she was leaving Prince Edward Island with her grandfather, um, they met up with, that's her father, you, and that's her grandfather, Senator Donald Montgomery. So in any case, um, on the day that they were leaving the island in August 1890, John A. Macdonald happened to be on the island. He and his wife were touring Prince Edward Island, and somehow her grandfather got in touch with the train station at, at Hunter River and asked, asked the train to stop in Kensington to take on Ellen Montgomery and and the senator. And so Montgomery, on her very first trip on a train, traveled with the prime minister and his wife um, to Summerside. So um, she was invited to sit between the prime minister and his wife. Um, so she, as she said in her, in her journal, she sat, quote, demurely and scrutinized them both out of the tail of her eye. <laughs> she, she noted, Sir John is, a, is this prime looking old man, not handsome, but pleasant faced. Lady Macdonald is quite stately and imposing with very beautiful hair, but not at all good looking and dressed, <laughs> and dressed in a very dowdy fashion. Now, I was quite interested in Lady Macdonald when I read that. Lady Macdonald was, was John A. Macdonald's second wife, and she was born Susan, Susan Agnes Bernard, the youngest of Theodora and Thomas Bernard, on a plantation in Jamaica. So her parents were plantation owners, but also had very important positions in the government, in the colonial government there. At age 50, her father died in a cholera epidemic, and they, the brothers and the family relocated to Canada around Barrie, Ontario. And one of the sons, you, or one of uh, Lady Macdonald's brothers, became a private secretary to Macdonald, and that's how he ended up marrying this particular woman. Now, she was a very interesting woman. Um, she kept a diary. And she was noted for the notes that she kept as a prime minister's wife, and, and they're an important document. She also was she also was the director of an orphanage, the, fir the first orphanage in Ottawa. She was the director of that. And so developedly religious, of course, she had to uh, represent the standard of what it meant to be a good woman in Canada. 
So I was very interested. She, you know, she also had lost a parent. She kept a diary, and she, the notion of, of uh, orphans emerged. So Montgomery, as a seven, eight-year-old, um, she, she remembers having a fantastic, beautiful childhood of freedom. She would go to the seashore, she would play in the woods, and the McNeils had also fostered, taken in two young boys who had been orphaned as well. So she had two playmates for three, three years, and she was so delighted to have children to play with because she was both quite lonely as the only child in the household. And then three years later, she doesn't know why, but they went somewhere. But later on, she caught up with them in her life. She caught up with them later on um, when she was older. So Montgomery grew up with storytellers. And what I just want to point out here is that those storytellers became the subjects of her, her very, very first, right, um, very first books, uh, uh, pub publication, sorry. The first, uh, when she was out in Saskatchewan with her father, she published uh, an article uh, an article in the Evening Patriot, or Patriot as we would say, about La, uh, La Force, Cape La Force, and it was a legend that a captain was shot in the back by one of his um, men when they were to have a duel, but as the captain turned, he was shot. So the, he was buried where he fell, and so this is the name of this particular location. So she wrote about that. It got published in Charlottetown. And then while out in Saskatchewan, she also wrote, um, she wrote about uh, the Marco Polo, the wreck of Marco Polo, the ship, this fastest schooner that went ashore in Cavendish. And it was really most extraordinary because the crew was extremely multinational, international, and they all stayed in Cavendish for the whole summer. They boarded with families. They couldn't leave because the ship was stocked with lumber and they couldn't get it out for a long time and it had to be sold and they had to be paid. So there were also um, people from Europe, but there were also two people from the Pacific Islands, two Tahitians who were part of the, the crew. So she wrote, she wrote about that wreck and it was published in Montreal. So this is in... 1819, 1891, she at 16, she immediately starts publishing. So, um, I wanted to just, um, I think it's worthwhile at this point to just talk a little bit about Montgomery's writing, the, how she crafted her writing. Now, she's about 22 here. Uh, but she would have gone to teacher's college. When she came back from Saskatchewan, she went to, she studied for entrance into Prince of Wales College, and she succeeded, and she got some fifth place in, all, in the whole province, even though she had missed part of schooling when she was in Saskatchewan. And then she went on to teacher's college. She took a two-year course, a two-year program in one year, and she went to Bidford. Bidford? Yeah. And of course, the school is nearby. Is, is, this is the Dag Dag school but, here. But, her, but so, so in any case, she, she had a very happy time teaching. She loved it. She loved the community. She had big class. Usually, classes were, were, were filled with at least 30 to 40 students of all ages, young men who were towering over her. And I think, did anybody go to a one-room schoolhouse in this crowd? Yeah. So, um, yeah. so you'll know what I mean. And uh, I did too, actually. So, so um, she then, um, she saved her money that year. She made $180. She saved 100 of it. Because more than anything, Montgomery wanted to be a writer. She was ferocious and fierce in her desire to write. But she knew that she wasn't well educated enough, or she felt she wasn't well educated enough to do the kind of writing that she wanted to do. So she had $100. She wanted to go to Dalhousie and take one year, at least one year. She wanted to do a degree, but it seemed out of the question. 
So her mother gave her, her grandmother, Lucy McNeil, gave her enough money to go to Halifax and to study for a year. And that's what she did. And she studied literature and she had a wonderful time. And then she came back and she then went to, um, she then studied, she then taught again at Belmont after that for a year. And then um, lower the deck. Mm -hmm. and 1897 to 98. Um, and this was a very special place for her. She fell in love for, she enjoyed the, she, she enjoyed so much about this area and talks about it a great deal. So, her grandfather dies and she has to go back to see her, her grandmother, to look after her grandmother. And her grandmother's about 76 years. Her, her, um, so, so she goes, she leaves and she goes back to, to see her grandmother. And, um, but then she does get away to Halifax as a, an assistant editor on a newspaper, The Echo. But by this time, she's earning money from her writing. And she, she also had a column called Cynthia, where she gave advice. Where she told people about how to photograph. She knew how. She knew about uh, you know how to develop photographs, um, and she wrote this very interesting two pages about how to. How I just read one of them, but one one story, but it was amazing. So she had this. So she so she stayed in Halifax, but seven months later she realized she had to come to her grandmother, look after her grandmother, and she also felt that she didn't have enough time to, to devote to writing. So I'm just going to very quickly just say, um, just, just to give you a, an idea of how hard Montgomery worked on her writing. So, um, so her first earnings for her writing were, were from a, call, a publication called Philadelphia Golden Days and Boston's Youth Companion. And that was in 1895, when, 96 when she was in Dalhousie. And then in uh, 96, 97, she again uh, published, published for the first time using her own name. She, her first name was Maud Cavendish, but by 80, uh, 86, uh, sorry, 80, 96 and 97, she started using her full name, Lucy L. M. Montgomery. So um, she became engaged in Belmont, but she did break that, it was very difficult, but she did break that engagement. So after about this age, she's already she's already in Cavendish with her grandmother. So so she's published. She's writing and she's getting published and she's working extremely hard on her her writing. And she realizes that even though she has certain commitments at home because she has to assist in assist in the post office and look after things. She gardens, she's a church um, organist, she's very busy in the community, but she realizes she has time to roam the fields, to go to the shore, and to, and to think about her writing, and to work on her writing. And so um, she continues to, in 1899, she continued to publish in, in, in better uh, magazines like Good Housekeeping. She started to publish short stories, um, she became, uh, she, so she, she's developing this extreme, um, extremely good record of getting printed. In 1902 to 1904, around, she, around this time, she had published 103 stories and 92 poems. It's a phenomenal work record. So here she is in Cavendish, and she wrote in the kitchen in this, in, during the winter because her grandmother didn't want, her to, didn't want the house to have another fire. And she found that very confining, but she, that's where she did much of her writing in the kitchen during the winter and in her room, other ones. Now, she's busy writing, and, she, and this is Ewan MacDonald. He was Reverend Ewan MacDonald. He was ordained in Cavendish. First of all, he stayed in Stanley Bridge, but later on moved to Cavendish where he got got to see Montgomery every day at the post office. And um, she became engaged in 
1906. She struggled a great deal with decision. Uh, she wasn't sure, but she knew that she wouldn't have a home after her grandmother died. And women didn't ordinarily own land at that time. And she knew he was a very good person, an attractive person. She enjoyed talking to him, but she struggled with the decision. She thought a great deal about marriage and who she should marry, marry what kind of person she could marry, and still be a writer, and, and, and still have children. So, you and you and um, agree to wait for her until she until her grandmother died, basically. And he had to wait five years. So, um, so that's the beginning. Now, people have remarked that Montgomery was happier during 1904, 1905, 1906, when she wrote Anne Green Gables. She seemed to be in higher spirits. And, and so that, that joy that she felt spilled over into the pages of Anne Green Gables. And this is, a, this is the, an imprint from, the first, from, from Anne Green Gables, the cover at that time. And so she, she also became very friendly with a cousin that she hadn't known who was younger than her, Frederica Campbell. They, they became very close. So she had she had friends and she had she had she had a, a fuller life at that moment because think about it. She went back to Cavendish. Almost all of her friends were married and gone elsewhere, and she felt an intense loneliness. And then, of course, writing also is a very lonely occupation. So Montgomery wrote under all circumstances. She wrote when, when she was sad, she wrote when she was happy, she wrote in frigid rooms, and when she was teaching school, she would get up early and put on gloves and write. Um, and and she, would, she would write um, at every juncture in her life. It became the way for her, it became the way for her to feel full, content, and, and so her writing was um, established as crucial to her. So, Anna Green Gables, you probably know the story. You all know the story about the hat box. How many know about the hat box? Quite a few. But when she wrote the novel, and, and I think this is the other thing that really impressed me about Montgomery, she studied publishing. So she had an idea of who would take the book. So she, she sent it out to four publishers and they all rejected it. But, but she started writing in church um, magazines and had gradually built her repertoire. So she put it in a hat box in a spare room and just left it there for a year and a half or so. But in that moment of enthusiasm for life, she she found it again and started flipping through the pages and said, this is, this is, this is good, I'm going to try again. So she sent it to page publishing in Boston, and it was immediately correct. And not only that, as soon as they saw it and read it, they asked her to write the sequel. So within a year, she had yet a second novel. So there's a lot said about Anna Green Gables. And I want to talk a bit about some of her other novels. But, but what's really clear is that Montgomery became an international phenomenon. Um, by the end of the First World War, for example, she, she was a household name in the English-speaking world, not just Canada, in the world. She has remained in print ever since it was published. And um, as Mont Mary Rubio calls it, it's Canada's most enduring literary export. Now, there have been so many adaptations, there have been so many plays, musicals, you all know how many there are. It, it's, it's phenomenal. But I think it's worth pointing out that Kevin Sullivan's 1985 adaptation of Anna Green Gables was the highest rated television drama in Canadian history at the time. 
drawing almost 5 million viewers the first time, over 5 million. The second part, the largest audience for non-hockey broadcasts. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's a, a very significant <laughs> point. <laughs> Why, why, why is, what is it about Anne Green Gables that draws people all over the world? It's from a very particular place. It's from a very, a, a rural place about a girl. And I think, I'm just going to read this because it's so beautiful. Uh, Margaret Atwood admitted that she was a bit guilty about liking it so much because if, if everybody liked it, why? <laughs> so for her, she, she talks about the orphan in all of us. Atwood says that there's something about Montgomery that appeals to the orphan in all of us. Anne may be the orphan in all of us, but then so is Marilla. Anne is the fairy tale wish fulfillment version, what Montgomery longed for. Marilla is more likely what she feared she might become joyless, bereft, trapped, homeless, unloved. Each of them saves the other. It is the neatness of their fit, the psychological fit, as well as the invention, the humor, the fidelity of the writing that makes Anne such a satisfying and enduring fable. So when I said that Montgomery struggled over whether or not she should marry Ewan, she, she worried about that other side of not being getting married, being home, being in Cavendish and not finding somebody else. And and so this was this was a concern that she had. And she talked often in her in the first she talked about elderly women who never um, owned land. They didn't own land and they were always at the mercy or available to help family members. So to be unmarried, to be an unmarried woman in Montgomery's view at that time would be very difficult. So in any case, I want to talk a little bit here about Montgomery. The thing that Montgomery does is she embraces the everyday, the so-called ordinary, but she crafts it in such a compelling way that it becomes unforgettable. So Montgomery offers readings of the everyday that create a kind of intimacy with her readers and that express a sensuous appreciation of the, of the practices that connect people to a place. In her fiction, the sensory and sensuous connections are evoked in seemingly everyday and ordinary places. She takes seriously the cultural significance of the everyday and explores the richness of human experience located in daily in the daily lives, of daily domains. But her attention to the everyday and the local belied the cosmopolitanism that, she, that, that, she, that was part of her upbringing. As a child growing up in a small community on Prince Edward Island, she was connected to the larger world. Of course, we already talked about her father in Saskatchewan and her trip, but, but they kept the post office. So, so that was a huge connection, and it made her, it was very important for her writing because she could send things out without anybody knowing. And if she got rejections, nobody was the wiser for it. So it made her braver. She also saw magazines come in, maybe they weren't hers, but she, she, she had a sense of, she had a sense of a larger world. Uh, the Presbyterian, um, the Presbyterian church, ministers and missionaries, I have learned that uh, that Cavendish area, Malpec, was an, an amazing center of missionaries who have went over the world. For example, two Montgomery sisters spent over, between them, spent 50 years in Iran. One is still buried in Iran. Um, which there, there, uh, there's so many there's so much to be said about that, but I'll leave that for a moment. So, so, so she was, so she had. There were people in and out of the, the community. I already talked about the crew from, from the, um, the wreck, um, the political connections that her grandfather had. We've already talked about what that meant. That you, 
your first train trip would be, would be sitting between the Prime Minister and his wife. The local literary society, it, it was a very uh, sophisticated place, a lending library. Um, and that was all just part of the community. Um, her knowledge of poetry, her own interest in poetry and literature, her fascination with the visual, the fact that she had a camera in the 1890s is quite extraordinary, and that she could develop photos and could think about photography. So the visual, the speculative, the observation, all the scopic things around vision were extremely important to her. Um, she, she also enlarged her world by having pen pals with a man and a uh, teacher from uh, Alberta, Mr. Weber, and a, a man in Scotland. And she wrote to them all her whole life. And their correspondence, of course, has been uh, published. And it's absolutely fascinating. It's yet another angle on Montgomery's prolific um, writing and thinking. So uh, she, her extensive reading and access to books, it, it made her a bit different. Uh, and she was aware of that. But in, in the end, she was a modern, educated, actually financially independent often, if, if her income varied, and a career-minded woman who lived through cultural, political, social, and economic upheavals. And always the writing. It was the writing that always made her feel alive. She demonstrated um, what we would call a modern agency in various ways. She broke an engagement, not so easy to do at that time. Um, she delayed marriage. She explored careers, a teacher, assistant editor, writer. She sued her, she sued her American publisher three times. Uh, and, and, and through her fiction, she created characters and communities of deep and abiding interest in both cross-cultural and international contexts. People, I lived in India for quite a while. I worked for the UN there, and I met all these women who read Mantham, knew Prince Edward Island because of Mantham. Everywhere I've gone except the Pacific. They, they, so you, you get a sense of Montgomery, how, just how famous, how enduring she has been. Montgomery draws from her every day and creates some, um, and, and maintained a place for herself in the global community. And yet, during those years, as a young adult woman, as she wrote her best-selling novels, she was not allowed to vote, did not inherit, could not inherit, would never inherit her grandparents' land. And, re and she also recorded the beauty of her beloved island, noting the subtle changes that were already taking place. Um, changes were already underway in her beloved Prince Edward Island. Now you know that she loves trees. And, and, her, and her, her, her heroines love trees. If you remember Anna Green Gables' Idlewild, anybody know Idlewild? The, the play, the area in Mr. Bell's woods where Diana and Anne played. They created it as a domestic space, and it was, very, it was their place to play. One day, it was cut down without notice. And Anne mourned, and she cried, but she didn't, couldn't do anything. Now, meet Emily of New Moon. Emily of New Moon is another character. She, she too was going to lose her favorite woods. Lofty John was going to cut it down because he had he was angry with her aunt. So, uncharacteristically, Montgomery sent Emily to a Catholic priest to try and talk to Lofty John so that he wouldn't cut the woods down. So it's a big story about this about this this woods that. Emily was trying to save, and she did. He, Lofty John agreed not to cut it, if, and eventually Emily bought it, and she records that. She bought this, this particular woods. So you will find stories uh, about trees, you, descriptions of stories, uh, descriptions of trees, and I can remember when I read, I was, 
we didn't have Anne of Green Gables at home, but it was read to me by a grade three teacher. And I, I think that many of you who grew up in that one room schoolhouse too would know that the books that we were used in the 50s and 60s were American texts. Does anybody remember reading Dick and Jane? Or? Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and it didn't look much like Prince Edward Island, did it? <laughs> and so, and, and I, I was really astonished at this. People put up for sale signs and somebody else would move in. They sold land. Like, that was unheard of even. So, so when I heard, I think the thing that mattered for me when I first heard Montgomery's book was that it, it reflected where I lived, in rural Prince Edward Island. And so thereafter, every time my father went with the axe to cut down small sap, poplar saplings, I would hurl myself between him and the axe <laughs> and be annoying. But, but that's the kind of effect that, he, that she had on, on her readers because she lived in a sentient landscape. The landscape was animated, it was sentient, it was alive to her. She saw her land, she saw Cavendish landscape differently than most people would have been. And so, um, so the thing about Montgomery that's also very interesting and important to think about is place, because she created this enormously powerful notion of place. Uh, this woman, by the way, is taught school in Cavendish and became a friend of Montgomery's. So, um, this is Anne of Avonlea, the second book that she published within one year. She had to write it in a year. She had to get, write another book in a very, very short time. So she worked tirelessly for the company that actually didn't pay her very well. I think she got nine, nine cents a copy. Her contract was terrible. I, I wanted to point, I just want to uh, note this photo because that's Lucy Maud Montgomery on the end there having tea. And in between uh, Maud Montgomery and Ewan McDonald is Fred Campbell, Frederica Campbell. And this was um, a very, very close friend of Montgomery's, although they were related. And, they, and the Campbell household was a very important and happy household for Montgomery. So, when Montgomery wrote, uh, she often uh, she drew on her journals, she drew, drew on her childhood descriptions of afternoons in, at the Campbells or at the Montgomery or at, at particular aunt's places. So um, she always had a ready store of ideas. Now, uh, place. So she, she evokes a, a very powerful notion of place. And that strikes chords around the world, actually. Um, but at the same time, her characters are, are they're deeply attached to their places, and they animate those places. Um, but um, they're Anne of Green Gables, Pad of Silver Bush, Jane of Lantern Hill, Emily of New Moon, and so on. But the preposition off is a crucial reminder that place is contingent. It's um, and belonging can be ephemeral. The displaced children, the orphaned or semi-orphaned children who inhabit Montgomery's literary world also underline her concern with place and displacement and the recognition that belonging and alienation are, are integral to, to place and displacement. In Montgomery's work, happiness and home are fragile constructs that can be shattered in a moment. And that's from Eberly. Um, so um, now, just going back to Canada, Montgomery, of course, lived through turbulent change. Think about it. Born in 1874, she died in 1942. She experienced the First World War, the pandemic, where she lost Frederica, her cousin, the depression that followed between the wars and then the Second World War. So it, 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 was, it was shattering for her. So change is an undercurrent in Montgomery's work and certainly in her journals. And you know, she moved, she, she was born in the Victorian era, so to speak, and then moved into another area under King Edward. And so, so a movement, a, a totally different era. Um, 
So change is an undercurrent in her work. And she always said that she was a hater of change. Um, but she, she, could, she, she argues that, um, that as a hater of change, it, it, life was very difficult for her at that time. But as it was for other people, my, my grand, our, our grandmother was born in, um, in 1882. And our grandfather was born in 1873. So I remember my mother discussing those changes, how difficult they were. So with, with modernity, or becoming modern, moving into a modern world, a collective identity such as the nation expanded, particularly, of course, in Canada as a new nation. And private experiences are enhanced. But identities are also um, dispersed, and, and, um, and there's a heightened <coughs> fragility and and, and kind of transients to ideas of self and other. While, while the sense of belonging and community are of importance in Montgomery's writing, the community is in her novels, this is in her novels, is often far from ideal. There's conflicts, there, there's an unpredictability, there's unresolved conflicts, private quarrels, public feuds. The communities she describes are, are informed by religious, ethnic, gender, and class differences. Um, and of course, um, Mark Bulbury is very well aware of the changing um, representations of gen gen uh, gender. With the outbreak of the First World War, Montgomery wrote, and quote, the world in which I spent my, my girlhood and young womanhood passed away forever in one sudden overwhelming cataclysm. By 1914, Montgomery had written five bestsellers within six years. Think about it, five bestsellers in six years and felt pressure to create even more. She was living in Ontario, adjusting to marriage and motherhood, and she suffered the loss of her second child who died within hours of birth. The First World War and its aftermath uh, changed everything and ushered in a modern world that separated the younger and the older generations for whom, she argued, change had been experienced as something natural and cyclical. So Montgomery felt that she, her experience was profoundly different from her other generations. And these women did not know, she said, of her own family and others. They did not know, could not know, never, and, and never were the foundations of their lives torn away from beneath their feet. So the war, of course, was a pivotal moment in Canada. And Montgomery talks about war, the war in the journals. I'm just going to um, uh, say a little bit more about war here. Um, so the First World War um, and, and the Great Depression were, were, of course, sources of great anguish for Montgomery and many, many other people in the world. I'm sure many of you with ancestors who had a map in the kitchen with dots showing where the war front was and how many of the children were in the war. Did anybody, did anybody experience that? My um, grandmother had a map in the kitchen. Her three sons were in the war, so they would move to see where they were. Um, so Montgomery's optimistic belief that war would la the First World War would bring a lasting peace was, of course, shattered when the Second World War erupted. Um, she was, a, as Ed McDonald said, a hot conscriptionist. She, she supported conscription for the, for the First World War. But when the Second World War broke out, she was more skeptical about the possibilities of, of, a, of a war to end all wars. And in, in the very last book that she wrote, The Polites Are Quoted, she, she talks about war in, in a slightly different way. But we do know that, that um, War was an extremely important part of Canadian history, and it was for her. And reading Montgomery's journals, you really have a sense of how she experienced the war, because of course the pandemic happened after the war in 1919, and she lost her her very close person, as did so many others. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit here about some of her other novels, who don't always get the same attention. Um, Emily, this is Emily of New Moon. Emily of New Moon. Is, 
is a very, it's a, it's a trilogy. There are three books, and Emily wants to be a writer. And this is really Montgomery's book about her own struggle to be a writer. She didn't have a lot of support. Uh, it, maybe she didn't have any support to become a writer when in Cavendish. She didn't have much support to be educated further, but she felt she was necessary, clearly wasn't. Um, and, and so Emily has the same struggle. But Emily is also an orphan. Her mother died. And as the book opens, Emily of New Room, her father is dying too. So she has to go with relatives. And so she lives with, ends up living with a very, very strict aunt Elizabeth, her sister, and cousin Jimmy. And these three books are very, very beautiful. I don't know if you can see the shadow. There's a shadow here. See that shadow? And that's the Wind Woman. Uh, Emily, Emily wrote about, um, wrote about, had a very intense relationship with nature, and she referred to um, the wind as a Wind Woman. And it's a very, it, it, it's not as simple as it sounds. It's quite complicated. Um, so th these are very beautiful books. If you haven't read them, I highly recommend them. And so it's really about a young girl, very sensitive, wanting to become a writer against all odds. And so Montgomery poured her heart into this book because she knew very well the, what kind of a struggle that was. And I, I think um, there's so much else in the book that's so beautiful. Now, we were speaking about the war. This is with Rilla Ingleside. Now, she wrote a series of novels, of course, about Anne. And this is, um, Rilla was Anne's youngest child. And this book is a war novel. No, there are very few war novels about the home front. There's lot, there are lots of novels about the war. But what's very special about Rilla of Ingleside, although it was not recognized as such, is that it describes what it means for a household to have children at war and to be left alone to fend for themselves, to try and survive the anxiety, the difficulty. And Rilla was a, the Anne, Anne of Green Gables' youngest child, and she was never thought that, she, there was never thought that she'd amount to much. But she, in fact, she became this extraordinary person during the war because, because she had to. And she, there was a, a, an orphan, and she took charge of the orphan and raised that orphan during the war. And, and uh, it was a very, um, it, when you read this, you have a very strong sense of what Canada meant to Montgomery um, during the Second World War. So, so this trilogy is, a, um, the, the trilogy um, of Emily's trilogy is about writing, becoming a writer, and all the difficulties, and also the fact that these children are up against very strong, determined adults who are not their parents, but maybe a relative. And, and really, uh, as Kubar mentioned, the real romance in Montgomery's writing is the romance between young people and the older generation, where they fall in love, Anne and Martha fall in love, and Anne and Marilla fall in love with each other. Um, and, and so, this is a very interesting novel about the war, and, and as, um, as, as, uh, Life would have it after the Second World War, after the First World War, um, a new kind of way of looking at literature emerged, uh, modernism, and Montgomery's um, writing about ordinary places and children, and it became uh, marginalized, extremely marginalized because. It was a much more male-focused kind of writing that occurred after the war, a kind of elitism that excluded women, especially women who wrote about children. And, and so Montgomery felt that very keenly. It was one of the most painful episodes in her life because she was always confident about her writing and her confidence eroded. Um, and so, so in any case, uh, it didn't stop her from writing, but it but it, it compounded the problems that she had at home. Uh, her husband had become ill. He had a first major 
um, bout of um, melancholia or depression in 1919 and has followed her through the rest of her writing life. And so to have her reputation, to be marginalized was extremely difficult for her. So this book was not recognized because it was part of that idea that Montgomery was, had nothing significant to say. Um, Mistress Pat is another book that's not very well read. There's two, there's two books. Um, um, Pat of Silver, Pil Silver Bush is the, the particular um, place where Pat lives. Now this is another one that's very close. If you want to read novels that where Montgomery figures in them in some important way, the Pat books are, are another really important um, couple of books. Um, Pat is obsessed, apparently, with, she hates change, she doesn't want any change. And so, um, she's particularly in, enamored with her, with her place. She loves her place. And she, she always um, defers marriage. She looks like she's going to get married, last minute she's not going to get married. And so this has been seen as an obsession or some kind of pathology. But, but actually, one could also argue, as scholars have, that monk, it speaks to the fact that women always have to leave their land, generally speaking. If you marry, you have to leave. I work in the South Pacific, and uh, if you marry, you have to go to your husband's place. And you even have to cut ties with your familial place. So Pat was too attached to her place to leave it. This is a, a novel that uh, it was written during the Depression, um, and it's, there's conflict, and there's con family conflict, there's people are, the, the father's thinking about migrating out to out west, there's diff financial difficulties, and, and Pat becomes that woman who's not married. And her, her, her brother marries, and a woman comes in and displaces Pat. It's no longer Pat's place because the, it's the wife's place. And anyway, I won't tell you what happened, um, but uh, it's, a, it's very, very interesting. I, I love it especially because, uh, because my, my mother's family was Scottish, and uh, my mother's grandfather died young. He knew he was going to die, and he wrote a will that said, do not sell the land. Do not sell the land. And so strangely enough, this land has passed through the females, and it was never sold. Of course, um, so, so that idea that, that don't sell the land, but Pat had that same affinity and attachment to land, and so did Montgomery. She knew she had to leave her home in Cavendish. I'm just going to mention this novel. It's not one of her most famous novels, but I loved it. Rainbow Valley. Has anybody read? Mm -hmm. yeah. and, um, and and this is um, a story about Anne's children, Anne of Gables' children, and the children of a minister. But the minister's wife has died, and he's a very abstract thinker, and he doesn't look after his children. So his children are always in trouble, and uh, it's just, it's so much a children's story about, it shows the agency of children, because children really didn't have much agency in the early days of Canadian history. And here children do all kinds of things, they arrange marriage, they already arranged an adoption for a little young girl who turned up. So, so, um, so this is what's so interesting to read, is, is the relationship among children. And also, it has the most <coughs> uh, quite unevil orphan in it. I put that in quotations. Anne was was a perfect orphan, but Mary Vance was had been treated very very harshly. She had uh, she ran away from her the family that had mistreated her, or families that had mistreated her as foster children. Foster foster children were often treated poorly all over the world. And so this idea of orphanage, or, or, you know, orphans uh, taking care of children, Montgomery wrote against Victorian ideas of children. 
and she gave children agency. They did things. They fixed things. <coughs> Even when adults were tired and ambivalent, children in this novel fixed things. So, okay. Now, the national park. As you know, national parks are inst an instrument of nation building, and, and many nations in <coughs> the 1990s, especially in North America, started building par parks. So, in October 15, 1936, Montgomery writes about the creation of the National Park in Cavendish because quite a, a, a lot of places in Cavendish were uh, expropriated to build a park. And it was very, very painful. Very, very painful for people to lose their places because we've just talked about how important the place was. Our grandmother also lost we also lost, our grandmother lost land at Dalvey, from Dalvey Pond to the sea and over it. And it, it completely changed, it was completely, it was so terrible for her, even though it, it wasn't a poor old brother park. But I want to read this because this tells you Montgomery's struggle with it. Yesterday forenoon, I spent I spent back, I went back in, in my dear woods, I went through all the lanes, I may never walk in them again. And if I do, they will, they will be mine no longer. They will be part of the National Park. They will be open to the public, desecrated by hordes of sightseers. I hope there's no tourists here. <laughs> and by pleasure seekers. Huntress, it is a bitter thought to me. All my life, these woods have been sanctuary. They never failed me. I never failed to find comfort and understanding and healing for mind and soul there. So, but she continues. When I left my wits, I went across Pierce Field to the Hill Road in 1929. I commented on the fact that the grove in the old corner had grown up again and was again lovely. And in the very end, the very next year, McCorby's, McCorby's cut it down again. And now five years later, it is growing up for a third time Perhaps now that it is part of the, the park, they will let it live. Mm -hmm. So you can see the conflicted nature. Our grandmother uh, figured out that if she got birch logs, I don't know who told her this, birch logs fat from the abattoir and hitched it to a horse that she could move the whole family to the last piece of land that was left. And that's what she did. They lived, the horse inched along for six months. I'm sure they're not the only, she wasn't the only one to do that. Um, Maud Lucy Maud Montgomery did get a house, her own place, in Toronto, um, after Ewan retired from, <coughs> from Norvell. Um, and she, lived, she died in that house in 1942. That was the house. She did get to own her own house at the end of the day. Now, um, I have no idea what time it is. Where's the last page? Oh, 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 gosh. Okay, here's yeah. it. This is it. I think this is very interesting. She wrote it after the First World War, 1922. Just think about it. I think there's something in it for us to think about. She wrote, can't they see that civilization is founded on and held together through sentiment? Passion is transient and quite as often destructive as not. Sentient remains and binds. So from Montgomery, um, feeling, sentiment was crucial to, to nation building. And you, you can see that theme throughout her whole book. Um, okay, I'm going to stop here, but before I do, can you indulge me for just another minute? Mm -hmm. I, I received a huge gift from Montgomery. I, I didn't, um, my, my partner uh, became very sick, and I couldn't travel anymore to the South Pacific. So I started working on Montgomery, and I happily so. Um, but I didn't know, I didn't know how intense Presbyterian, evangelical missions were here, how, how, how strong they were here, how rooted they were here. So I work in the South Pacific, just above um, New Zealand in that map. 
and that's in Naichim. And I, I work in this area of the world. It's an island in what is now, it was the he New Hebrides, but it's Vanuatu now, and it's been independent for 40 years. But I, I worked in Vanuatu, but I didn't know that Cavendish was instrumental in the conversion of these islanders to Christianity. I had no idea, how could I not know that growing up in Prince Edward Island? And so I, uh, my, my husband was getting treatment over in Nova Scotia, in, uh, sorry, in New Brunswick, and I went to the Sackville archives, and I found out that John Getty, because I heard of him, but everybody said he was uh, from Nova Scotia, which he was, but nobody ever said that he spent years in Cavendish and was ordained in Cavendish and was so intent on launching a mission that he actually went to the South Pacific to unite him with his wife Charlotte and started and converted islanders. And it was the most extraordinary thing. I'm sure many of you have seen this. Um, John Getty, Minister of Cavendish in New London, pioneer missionary. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I would never have, I'm sure I would never have known this um, if I had not studied Montgomery. This is the church that he built. At one time, it was almost the largest church in the Southern Hemisphere. The islanders told him it would fall down because of the cyclones, and it did. But, but the stones remain. It's a huge story, and I became really very interested in, in, in the history of Cavendish and the missionaries. It, it's an extraordinary story. I'm sorry I went so long, I lost track of time, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jane. Uh, will you take a few Yeah, sure. Uh, does anyone have a question? No. Is it just... Um, you mentioned that uh, the wife of John A. MacDonald kept a diary or a journal, and I was just wondering whether she had anything to write or say about losing Mom Montgomery. Uh, I, never, I haven't seen it because I've just learned about her now. Yeah. I don't think she would have because it was, it was uh, I don't think she would have, but, but still it was an interesting coincidence. And also, you know, she it is a well-respected uh, document, you know. Be worth following up on to find out whether she might have said yeah, something. It, yeah, it's very interesting. She lived for quite a long time after her husband died. Yes. My mother was the school teacher in Park Corner during the late 30s oh. and met Lucy Maud on several occasions. And she also boarded with the Montgomerys. Uh, she described Lucy Maud as a very interesting but somewhat bitter old lady. <laughs> Would that be an accurate description? Yeah, I think I think her life is extremely difficult. And I think she, if you read the journals, um, she was extremely difficult. Yeah. But she wasn't just embittered, but I can see why someone would think that for sure. How what, what year what year is the Late 30s? Uh, she was there, I think, from 34 to 39. Oh, okay. So it would have been Montgomery's last visit to the island, too. And it, it was a very particularly hard time. Montgomery also, M Montgomery also suffered from bad nerves, from what was called neurasthenia. And so she, she did suffer a great deal. She had a, a very, very hard life. And I can see why, why that would be. Said, but, but I think reading the, the journals are, give a, a, a clearer idea of Montgomery's life at the end. I was intrigued by your comments about uh, her writing about the agency of children. Um, some of her very best works, nobody ever talks about like Jane of Ledger Hill, which is all about yeah. a little girl who, who rescued yeah. her parents, yeah. you know? I mean, it's like uh, the world is oppressing them, and she's, she's, she risks her life to make it come out right. And um, if, if this kind of thing is what she was writing in her later years, and nobody was noticing, 
That would be a good reason to be miserable because I mean this is some of her best stuff. Yeah. Yeah, no, she she it was very difficult for her to be sidelined. And and her books have proved to be enduring. And I think you're right, Jane Chain of Lantern Hill, it's only one book. It's really worth reading, it's wonderful. And it's about uh, a really bad grandmother. <laughs> who separates her daughter from the husband, the islander, and, and you're right, Jane brings them back. Yes? It's not so much a question as a comment, but I worked in a children's libraries, and that really brought home to me who has been a dying the wool fan of Elle Montgomery since I read first grade Tap. And Tap was actually the first oh. book I ever read. Oh, that's amazing. And a boy in grade five said to me, oh, you've not read Anne yet? And I said, no. And he said, oh, if you like Pat, you'll love Anne. <laughs> 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 Pat has a special place for me. But um, I learned through the courses I took in the way that, you know, library journals could would read articles, how how short changed she was yeah. because she wrote not only girl stories but a series of girl stories. And that was like the bottom of the heap. Yeah, and that's a really interesting comment. And what I wanted to say actually was that um, men used to read, it wasn't so polarized that only men would read certain stories. And this happened post war. And I think it was the masculinist ideology post-war that, that fueled just, that. Just one other thing I'd like to add, though, mm -hmm. is that what really, really impressed me, who, well, like I already said, was very impressed and thought she was wonderful to begin with, I would be hard-pressed to name you one writer of Canadian children's books or young adult books who will not say in an interview somewhere how influenced yeah, exactly. they were yes. by Helen Montgomery. Mm -hmm. I don't think yeah. there's anybody that she didn't yeah. influence. Yeah. I, and I, that's a wonderful point you've made. She has influenced generations of of women writers, very fine women writers in Canada. But I just want to say, uh, you know, Mark Twain wrote to her immediately after yeah. and said, what a great, this is a you know, beautiful story. Um, uh, the Prime Minister of uh, Great Britain wrote to her as a fan letter. This is Stanley Baldwin. Uh, it was a fan letter. Mm -hmm. The, the uh, you know, um, Prince of Wales, she was summoned to meet Prince of Wales. The, the, she, she was very honored. People recognized she gave the world something. And, and obviously, her influence endures. Yes. Say so, but but I don't think my family read her. That my grandmother would have read her. I think you know it depends. Some I, I think that, you know some. It's it's hard. To, I, I know that people would have thought it was amazing, and she does talk about that in the journals. Uh, but the struggle. I think about it. Six books in five years, bestsellers. I don't think people thought how difficult it was to do that, and how much she she how effort how the effort she put into doing that. She became a fellow of the uh, Royal Arts. Yes. So, yes. yes, thank you for adding that to She had, absolutely, she was, she was recognized. And I think sometimes I feel a little disappointed on the island because she's celebrated and commemorated, but also so commodified that some young people, my students, I've always asked them, have you read Montgomery? They've never, they've never read Montgomery. And I think they're missing something. And now, of course, there's Anne with an E. If she is as famous as we all like to think she is, why is none of her writings included in the English language curriculum at the high school level? Well, I think she spent uh, relegated to the margins of, you know, Unfortunately, children's literature. Uh, I, at one point, that she was on the curriculum for grade nine, mm -hmm. but I think by grade nine, you know, probably better in luck because I haven't already read any to give them relative English time. 
Yeah. Because a lot of teenagers, when I worked at junior high, they loved Rilla when I introduced them to Rilla. Mm -hmm. But I don't think they, they would have liked Anne, and most teachers didn't pick to do Anne as their mother. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's a different time, of course, so she wrote Anne mm -hmm. Published in 1908, so much has changed. If she lived through turbulent changes, the, the changes that are occurring at the moment, um, you might think about young people and climate change and the Anthropocene and war. These are all. Uh, I just I think I'll draw uh, this to a close. We have a uh, and Adrian after this as well. I just want to make two comments. Uh, uh, one, my first introduction to Ellen Montgomery was in grade four. Uh, Miss Dolly Matthew, in, in my grade four teacher, read Emily of New Moon uh, every Friday afternoon. And so I can still remember the uh, Emily under the table and all the relatives oh, yes. talking about yes. what, they're going, what are we going to do with this child? Yeah. And so, get, uh, you know, children of that age, as I was, I suppose I was 10, retain more than uh, all the reading I've done since, perhaps. <laughs> but I, I live in the United Kingdom, and uh, if I say I'm from Prince Edward Island, uh, many people will look blank and they'll say, oh, uh, is that near Vancouver or Queen Charlotte Island? <laughs> but uh, I can tell you, everyone knows, uh, anyone who's read uh, Anne of Green Gables or knows Ellen Montgomery, and frequently that will happen to me over there. And uh, uh, Anne of Green Gables uh, was, uh, the BBC did a, 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 people, a people's oh, novel. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And Anne of Green Gables occurred, I think, in the top... 20 or yeah, 30 I think novels. Yeah, maybe even and these are adults, you know, yeah. choosing their yeah. favorite novels as yeah. well. Um, well, Jane, that was a fascinating uh, introduction to the whole range of Montgomery's life from her birth in 1874 up to her death in 1942. And you related it to uh, the historical events that were occurring in Canada at the time. So, on behalf of the uh, audience and uh, the Bedeck Historical Society, I want to present you with a little you token you of your of appreciation. <laughs>
Okay, well, relax.